Dan se pogo yak ka kyo na nas kum na ki tam ka penito tawinan Hello everyone I'd like to thank you once again for coming to listen to us here today Before we begin let me begin by paying respects to all those First Nations, Inuit and Métis, from the land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Nations, to the elders past and present, and to those yet to come, we pay our respects. And to those courageous enough to venture across the cultural abyss that exists in this country, we pay our respects. To those who are struggling to protect their lands and their waters, we pay our respects. And to those who defended and continue to defend their lands and their waters, and to those who gave their lives so that we could stand strong, we pay our respects. And to those who reclaim their languages and revitalize their traditional practices and to those who maintain the old songs and even continue to create new ones, we pay our respects. And finally, we pay our respects to those who use art as the voice of our times. So please welcome John Hampton to Wapatas Center's seventh in conversation event as part of the indigenizing the art museums virtual series this is an initiative that opens a dialogue with curators and today a director on the forefront of indigenizing the museums and examining institutional collections and archives from around the world this series was developed by our own wapata team who are working on a global indigenous initi outreach initiatives. And it's led by Brittany Pitsiolak, Bergen, Natalia Chestapolova, and Mariah Miwasigi. We'd also like to thank and acknowledge Lisa Smith of the Onsite Gallery for her ongoing uh, work with us as a key partner and supporter of our virtual platform for Indigenous art. And our appreciation goes out to the university president, Anna Serrano, as well as to the Canada Council for the Arts for their continued support of the Wapata Center. So today, once we're underway, and once the conversation gets going, I invite you to use the Q&A chat to post your comments and your questions. And of course, depending on the available time at the end, uh, we'll be sharing our, the questions with John, who will respond to them. So let me introduce John. John G. Hampton, they, them, or he, him, is a curator, artist, and administrator, and the current executive director and CEO of the McKinsey Art Gallery in Regina, Saskatchewan. They hold a master's degree in visitor visual studies, sorry, and curatorial studies from the University of Toronto. He has a BA from the visual arts from the University of Regina. And John is a citizen of the Chickasaw, Chickasaw Nation of the United States. He's also a citizen of the United States and Canada. And he grew up uh, in Regina, incidentally. And we may talk about that a little bit. Uh, they've also held uh, previous positions um, at the University of Toronto. Uh, uh, sorry, he was the executive director of the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba in Brandon, Manitoba. He was also the artistic director of the Trinity Square Video here in Toronto and was a curator at the Neutral Ground Artist Run Center. In addition to his role at the McKinsey Art Gallery, John, holds an adjunct curator appointment at the University Art Museum, University of Toronto. He's the adjunct professor at the University of Regina and is co-chair of the Indigenous Curatorial Collective Board of Directors, which we'll talk about 
later today. So welcome, John. Kokma, hello. And what what territory are you in these days? Uh, I'm here up in Treaty Four territory, uh, homeland of the Métis, traditional lands of the uh, Cree, Soto, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. Uh, some some contested histories of, of the Blackfoot Confederacy uh, here. Uh, uh, guest on this territory, my. Uh, homelands down in the southeastern United States, but the reservation is a 150-hour walk over in Oklahoma. Excellent. Well, let me congratulate you, John, on your new position as director and CEO of the McKenzie Art Gallery, uh, the first Indigenous director in this country, Canada. Uh, it's a gallery I know very, very well. In the old days, when I used to work and live in Regina, it was called the Norman McKenzie Art Gallery. So as you said, you're born, uh, you're Native American, born in the USA. Um, and for those of you out there, John uh, moved to Regina with his father. John was just a young kid at the time, about 30 years ago. His father, Eberhampton, uh, was the uh, president of uh, which is called now the First Nations University of Canada, the University of Regina. He attended the University of Regina and then later at the University of Toronto where he studied curatorship. And uh, for a while, as I said, you were the uh, executive director of the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba in Brandon. So now you're back in Regina, back to your old stomping grounds. <laughs> yeah, so let's have, that. yeah. Uh, so let's begin, uh, and I want to talk about uh, a bit about the McKenzie Gallery. So if we can have the first image, please. And I want you to begin uh, talking about the McKenzie, because the, the McKenzie itself has a long and storied career, uh, and certainly in relation to Indigenous art, because as we say, I think it's undergone indigenization for several decades. And so can you talk about Mackenzie's gallery by perhaps giving the audience uh, uh, some context for those who do not know this gallery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, Mackenzie Art Gallery, uh, formerly the Norman Mackenzie Art Gallery, was founded on the uh, collection of Norman Mackenzie, which was uh, uh, upon his passing, he bequeathed this collection to the University of uh, Saskatchewan Regina campus, now the U of R. Uh, and so we opened in 1957 uh, and moved to our current facilities and became independent in 1990. Uh, but uh, as far back as the 70s, uh, I really, uh, put, we put up this slide because these are two important figures in the history of the McKenzie for me. Uh, I, I think about Bob when I think about uh, the history of indigenizing the Mackenzie Art Gallery. Uh, he was uh, worked at the Mackenzie in the 70s, uh, delivering a new program, uh, the provincial outreach program, touring works from the collection out to uh, rural Saskatchewan, out to uh, reservations, out to, uh, and uh, he. Uh, continue to be involved in the Mackenzie through the rest of his life and uh, curating, co-curating many shows, including this uh, landmark show, Pow Wow, an art history, uh, and uh, which was presented in 2000. I was a teenager at the time. Uh, I went to that opening and it was a real landmark experience for me uh, to see, uh, you know, growing up, you know, Re Regina, lots of our cities are quite segregated. Uh, and uh, see, so I grew up in the South End and uh, in schools, institutions that were predominantly white. Uh, and, but then going to ceremony, to powwow, and uh, seeing those as Indigenous spaces uh, and not putting too much thought about how uh, I understood those as distinctly separate spaces. Uh, and this was a real merging of worlds, going to this fancy opening reception uh, at an art gallery uh, with uh, representations of the powwow and art history there, and Bob being a 
uh, family friend and Leanne as the uh, the first uh, Indigenous head curator of any public gallery in Canada, uh, which I didn't register the importance of all of these things on a national and art historical uh, register, but I did for, for me personally. The, uh, uh, and I guess we could move to the next slide mm -hmm. there because uh, uh, this, uh, our conservator just gave me these photos recently. She wanted to share them of uh, the photos from the reception and didn't realize that there were a few photos of my dad in there. Uh, <laughs> here's, uh, here's him, uh, Ibrahampton on the left uh, with the previous uh, director Kate Davis uh, with Leanne and Bob. Uh, and uh, it was just so funny to see this photo that's just, you know, mm -hmm. in the same building I'm in over there and thinking about uh, the paths that we take and uh, what type of doors are open through the activities that curators are doing through the program and through the artists' work. And uh, it just seemed like a pretty important moment there to think about how the path that I ended up taking here to, to the Mackenzie. Yeah. Um, I, I worked with Kate Davis for a, a little while when she came to the Art Gallery of Ontario in, in Toronto. And of course, I knew Bob uh, quite well when we almost grew up together at the Norman Mackenzie Gallery uh, back in the late 70s. <laughs> so I couple of figures in the in the photograph that I that I knew well and certainly have contributed to the community both in Regina and Toronto etc uh, but before we go in uh, before we talk to uh, about your work as museum director I wanted to ask you a, a couple questions about you as an artist uh, and 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 maybe your indigeneity your indigenousness so I think we have a slide of, of some of your work. So maybe you just want to talk over uh, the video and tell us about what is the intersection between your curatorial and your creative practice? Because many uh, indigenous curators have gone through the same, uh, the same road, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, I think we could just press play on this and let it run. Um, the, this is a, piece uh, from 2016. I don't have a real title for it. I call it, it Footsteps, I guess, is the official title. Uh, but it's my artistic practice. I started as an artist uh, and, and sort of found my way into curating. But in retrospect, I realized that it was all always quite curatorial in nature. So I was interested in the relationship between objects, uh, specifically art objects, and viewers, artists, broader society, and the role of perception, and how context and content is created. Uh, and so that's, um, so the, it seemed like curation was a, a natural extension of that to work directly with artists and uh, I gradually became more interested in, uh, maybe I've always been more interested in other people's art than my own. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, I brought uh, in, in the shows I'm most proud of, uh, I brought uh, some of that, uh, I guess, artistic approach to thinking about exhibitions and their reception into the work and had a nice collaborative uh, experience. Sorry, it's sort of hard to speak over that particular YouTube <laughs> comment uh, thread there. Um, and, uh, but so this piece was created between two shows, Rock, Stones and Dust and In Dialogue. And some of the uh, ideas that I really wanted to explore in those shows, but maybe weren't the exact focus of the artists, uh, then this work sort of was a release valve, a way of me bringing out some of those uh, conversations uh, without uh, without burden, without putting too much of a burden of my own interest onto yeah. the exhibition to let the the artists really drive that show. Yeah. So do you see this kind of work shaping your approach to curation 
as well as uh, in the museum, as well as your gallery governance, for example? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's just starting curating. Uh, Curtis Collins, who's the director of the Dunlop at the time, is having a conversation with him moving from curation to directorship. Uh, and he said, well, really, it's just uh, the things you're doing, uh, rather than curating a show, you're curating an institution and thinking about the larger artistic vision. And, and I felt sort of a similar way from going from artistic practice to curatorial, of just thinking about uh, doing a similar type of uh, creative cultural work, mm -hmm. uh, just with uh, uh, working more specifically with uh, relations and people. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to talk just a little bit about, um, you know, being American uh, now here in Canada, because there seems to be uh, different kinds of conversations, yet there's a lot of similarities. Um, and even in just terminologies, we often use, such as Americans will use Eskimo, we use Inuit. Uh, there's terms such as First Nations, Native American, or uh, versus Native American and Indian in the United States. So I'm just wondering how you navigate these kind of conversations around indigeneity and, and uh, Native identity as a Native American living in Canada, how do you negotiate that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm heavily influenced by Canadian dialogue, by uh, Indigenous folks uh, from really spe even specifically from this territory. Yeah, I spent my earlier years in Alaska uh, when my parents were with the University of Fairbanks. Uh, and a lot of so the teachings outside of my blood family uh, from uh, my extended family and adopted family came from Lakota, Cree, Métis folks, uh, uh, some of whom were working in Saskatchewan, uh, part of why we ended up coming down here. Uh, so, uh, and then later in my life with uh, uh, Anishinaabe folks uh, from from the prairies. So uh, a lot of my teachings are from the territory, but I'm still very much a guest here. Uh, and so I think that that medicine line dividing the United States and Canada, that is a colonial construct. Mm -hmm. So that's not what makes me a guest here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, that's a respect of the sovereign rights of the indigenous people to this territory, uh, but that colonial border does make a difference in our lives. And it's, uh, I recognize I've had a very different lived experience, uh, not just from being American, but from other types of uh, privileges as well. Uh, but that's a uh, uh, federal government there means a different relationship with government, with land, with the law. Uh, and so it's just having to have a, a acknowledge and respect those differences and know that I can't speak on behalf of any indigenous folks here. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, something that I think just needs to be uh, a thought when you're a guest in, in territory and working with particularly with indigenous uh, culture and dialogue. I can certainly see that in you as a young person and other a lot of Canadian Americans who are moving around from job to job and uh, moving in, in and out of territories. But what, as you said, it gives you a lot of lived experience, you know, um, and so you take that with you. And one of the things that was uh, particularly interesting about you is before you came, before you were the director and CEO of the McKinsey, you, uh, you, were, you were working at the McKinsey Gallery, but uh, uh, I think you were on contract before but you wrote a uh, what's called an artistic vision, something uh, I hadn't really never thought about or, or, or heard before, but you wrote one for the McKenzie Gallery. I'd like you to talk about that. But you also, following that, you were, uh, I think, once you became the director, you helped establish uh, uh, what's called a, an Indigenous advisory circle. So 
perhaps you can tell uh, us a bit about this group first and then the artistic uh, vision for the programs at the gallery, because then I have more questions about that. Yeah, so the Indigenous Advisory Circle was first uh, established by Jeremy Morgan, uh, and then Anthony Kendall carried it on. And uh, when I arrived in 2018, then we started uh, a revamp of it. So uh, at the time when I worked here, it consisted of uh, Elder Betty McKenna, of Damon Badger Height, uh, Cherry Farrell Rissett, Adam Martin, Janine Windoff, and myself. Uh, and we, uh, that committee acted as advisors to the CEO uh, at the time, Anthony Kendall. Uh, and it's uh, a model you know, similar to the one that exists at OCAD. University, although a little bit of a different governance relationship. It's similar to the board level, but in an advisory capacity. Um, and as I was uh, just starting at the McKenzie, uh, I was tasked with helping write this artistic vision uh, and uh, had so had a contract working with staff, looking at curatorial reviews and uh, stakeholders. and. So he wrote this artistic vision uh, with four key pillars that we wanted to pursue over the next uh, four to five years, uh, which were radical diversity, cultural health, transformation, and sustaining and writing art histories. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't want to go over all the four pillars or principles or pillars as you refer to them. But there's one in particular I find kind of interesting on you call it cultural health. I think it's an interesting concept, but let me preface my question by uh, uh, just saying that, you know, when we think of indigenous communities today across the country, uh, we think about the cultural health of the community, because as we know for, gosh, about five generations since uh, uh, the end of the Second World War, uh, maybe 70 years ago now, that a lot of our communities uh, have been in the process of rebuilding and uh, rebuilding um, what, what essentially was erased uh, through government uh, policies, uh, both in Canada and the United States. It really, you know, it tore apart that, that, that cultural body of the communities, you know, and, and so here, I'm seeing this idea, this cultural health that you're referring to. So maybe uh, you can talk a little bit about that and, and how do you see it as building uh, a healthy community? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I came to the term cultural health uh, reflecting on, uh, I used to uh, do work with uh, completing the circle team, uh, which is where I first met Elder Betty, actually. Uh, my, my mom was on this, that, research group looking at uh, uh, indigenous protocols for end of life. Uh, and so I was editing the video on, uh, on multiple losses in uh, indigenous communities. And uh, Willie Ermine uh, from the Sturgeon Lake First Nation was sharing some teachings about the Plains Cree uh, epistemologies for health. Uh, and uh, from a whole body perspective. So looking at uh, the uh, community as a living organism with uh, and each of us playing a essential role, playing different roles in making up the, that body and about how, if any component, if your, your head hurts, you have a headache, or, uh, these other things, which uh, in a Western model, you try to isolate and you think about uh, uh, treating just that area, but it throws off your whole body and you're not able to, to function the way that's uh, uh, at your best self. And so uh, thinking through that from a, from a cultural lens, from what, what's our sphere of influence as an art gallery, visual art gallery, and thinking uh, that we can't just isolate uh, uh, the work that we do in the visual arts that we're doing cultural work uh, and we're stewarding the culture of this territory and we have a responsibility about how that intersects 
uh, with people's sense of self, with their relation to their community, with other forms of cultural practices, uh, and with other forms of health and like, and to think about it that whole body perspective. Um, I since have seen some Western uh, definitions of it uh, from some health education perspectives. So there's one with the Project School Wellness defined cultural health as referring to having a deep awareness of your personal culture and life experiences and understanding how they influence your value system, your worldview, and your practices, and while also recognizing and respecting the culture and life experiences of others and intentionally taking the time to uh, understand and respect those perspectives. And I think that those are really compatible uh, ideas and just, and that's been a really helpful tool for framing our programming and then also looking at how it uh, expands into our other operations. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to now that, now that you're at the, well, now that you're leading the McKenzie Gallery. So what areas do you think that you can actually apply these, the, this concept and other concepts at the, at the gallery? Mm -hmm. uh, so a big portion of that uh, is our internal culture. So our work culture, how we carry ourselves and relate to each other, uh, and the, and then also how we relate out to our partners, our visitors, and broader community. So thinking through that from a policy perspective, uh, at the time, with uh, it's our artistic vision to guide our programs. So thinking about the things that surround that, like uh, uh, our something as simple as our smudging policy, looking at the uh, uh, ceremonial aspects that we're able to practice those in the gallery and the work that the, you know, that this uh, uh, sitting bull's robe coming in here, the, the respect protocol and to get, you know, Elder Wayne Goodwill was able to come in and smudge that because we, uh, well, because uh, I went and I, I smudged all of the, smoke detectors in our building to, uh, to clean out our, our old uh, uh, anti-smudging policy. Uh, and uh, the, it wasn't really an anti-smudging policy. It just had a little too much procedure involved in, uh, as if coming from a place of fear um, of that that it will set off the smoke alarms, which of course it, it didn't when we did this process. Um, uh, and then also thinking about our responsibilities to the treaties and how we manage uh, our collection. So it's something that extends out to all of that. And, and the big part also goes into our education and community outreach. Uh, mm. Uh, you, you spoke about radical diversity, transformation, and writing art histories. I think those are also very interesting. Uh, but radical diversity, you know, when we think of radical, we always think of revolutionary or painful change, you know, something that's going to, you get in there and there's like thousands of people offering and in some kind of revolutionary format. We, we see that in television all the time. Uh, but I think the key idea, the, the word here within, within this is about change itself. And so I'm thinking, what is it that you're hoping to change uh, uh, within this context of radical diversity? Radical, yeah, radical diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that revolution happens in multiple ways and there's different roles people play. And some of it is that more uh, uh, militaristic, the warriorship. Mm -hmm. um, and what uh, we're hoping, so the radical word, I think uh, we'll have to reflect on that in the way it's perceived, but uh, really it's about offering different cultural perspectives in our programming between each gallery uh, to expand people's cultural understandings and horizons to help that everyone coming through those doors uh, we want to find something that they feel reflected, uh, that they feel like that speaks to them, and also something that maybe challenges and uh, pushes them to uh, uh, new 
worldview, a new understanding, seeing a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the questions I've asked uh, many of our speakers is about relationship with local communities, right? Local audiences, local communities. And you realize that there's various kinds of audiences that come to the galleries. So I was wondering what you see uh, Mackenzie's role in relationships to your local audiences and communities. Yeah, so the radical diversity concept came from reflecting on the Mackenzie's history, strong uh, track record with indigenous artists and communities and curators. Uh, and like most institutions, a very strong track record of showing Western and European art uh, histories and uh, perspectives, uh, but uh, not nearly as strong in, uh, in any other type of perspective. Uh, so I was thinking uh, about the need to move beyond settler and indigenous uh, uh, engagement and more seriously uh, work with uh, connecting with communities uh, that from other experiences and perspectives and to look at that really as an extension not as a set uh, this we have a commitment to indigenous communities and settler and we need a commitment to black and POC and refugee and other perspectives uh, but really as a continuation of our treaty responsibilities and, uh, and of uh, taking uh, the values of uh, the people of this territory seriously, of the hospitality that's been shown to me mm -hmm. and to others in sharing this territory uh, and extending that spirit of hospitality to, uh, to everyone who now uh, calls this territory their home. So one more question about your pillars. <laughs> I want you to tell me just a little bit about the sustaining and writing art histories. And what does this mean for Mackenzie uh, on the prairies? I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about the, uh, acknowledging the responsibility we have in shaping that our activities our publications, our exhibitions, the work we do is actively writing that art history of Saskatchewan, of the prairies, of the Great Plains, uh, and of the, uh, the other surrounding territories as well. So um, that's, uh, and uh, so that, that's something that uh, we've, we've done in multiple types of ways before of, uh, doing the major exhibitions around uh, Joe Fafard and Dick Sikansky, but uh, also of expanding that to look at what's unique perspectives we can bring here. Like we're, we have this forthcoming major publication on Fay Heavy Shield that Felicia Gay is working on, a uh, major show on, uh, on beating, uh, on, a radical stitch that Kathy Mattis, Michelle Lavalley, and Jerry Farrell Rosette mm -hmm. are working on, uh, doing one on uh, on whiteness, the history of whiteness, and uh, the unique circumstances of settling North America that created this invention, of, uh, this racial invention, um, and uh, the show that uh, that you worked on with uh, Anthony uh, and Serene Stump. Uh, Looking at that, uh, that really uh, amazing story uh, and the impact that he had here on the, the uh, indigenous community here that spreads out and has an international impact. Yeah. So, okay, now we're going to talk about your role as a director. So, maybe if we can get to the next slide. Um, last summer, you were interim, you came in as interim director. Uh, amid COVID, mind you. <laughs> and in this past January, you were appointed as the director and CEO. So, it, you know, during that time when I've listened uh, to a lot of directors and read a lot about different museums, and it's not been an easy time, particularly because cultural institutions 
rely so much on visitation, right? And uh, to do it online has been quite challenging. So uh, during this time uh, and during your transition into the role of curator, how have you been spending this time? Yeah, it's been a time of cultural crisis uh, that is shared quite widely. Uh, so uh, the uh, while it, that we're in a state of, uh, of uh, increased tensions and uh, and calls for uh, for racial justice, for uh, this uh, mental health crisis of a need to connect and to feel that a sense of uh, belonging and relation to each other, and these are really big issues that uh, we can't uh, exactly solve, but we have a role to play as cultural institutions about how we're uh, navigating those conversations, because that's our role really, right, as a space to gather and have those conversations that, that uh, help us define who we are as a society. So we've been uh, taking this time which we've got, we've been open and then uh, we closed uh, and we're hoping to open shortly again. Uh, and so there's the financial aspects of it, the policy, of the, uh, the schedules and coordinations and all of those logistic elements. But mm -hmm. uh, it's also a time for uh, soul searching and for looking at uh, what our role in our community is. So we, we've spent this time really looking at our, uh, re our responsibilities around equity, uh, around mental health, about uh, uh, doing, laying the groundwork for, for some future goals about how, who we're going to be coming out of this and spending this time focusing on internal change, things we can do uh, in the ways that we operate uh, so that we, when we do reopen, we can do that work uh, with others in a good way. Mm -hmm. Extend that outward. Yeah. Okay. Now we, uh, you spoke a little earlier about the institutional legacy. We talked a little bit about your own background, and uh, I assume now that there are a lot of expe expectations of what you can do, first Indigenous person as a director. So have you gotten a sense of these kinds of hopes that people are been talking to you about, or you've been listening into the wind, for example? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be, uh, it's really, uh, it, uh, honored and it's also very intimidating. Uh, and I want to <laughs> live up to those hopes, uh, but also to recognize as CEO, uh, even at the top, there's only so much you can do, particularly with uh, you know these uh, these institutions, our bodies within bodies, uh, and there's a, a whole. Everyone has a role to play, and the, and the board, the staff, the viewership, the union. Um, so, and the McKenzie has its own spirit and legacy and momentum, which uh, is. Uh, gives a lot of strength and also comes with its own uh, challenges as well. Uh, so if you think about, if I think about me as an individual making those changes and doing, living up to those expectations, then I think I'm doomed to fail. Uh, but uh, when I'm thinking a little bit more soberly uh, and realize that uh, I'm not alone, that uh, it's, that uh, I'm not even the main person doing this work, but about channeling the great work that's being done by so many others mm -hmm. uh, and just making the space and the opportunities for that, uh, for people to take hold of that. And then also uh, just build off of the, the work that so many others have already done. Of, uh, <coughs> Bob and Leanne, uh, uh, Michelle Lavallee, Pat Dedman, and yourself, of uh, uh, Jim Logan, of all these people who uh, set things in motion, which uh, we can just
just uh, continue to roll along. It's not starting from scratch, uh, even if uh, sometimes you get too in your head and uh, uh, and think about it that way. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, slip to the next slide. Um, because I wanted to talk a bit about your active role. <clears throat> Earlier, I mentioned that you were on the executive of the Indigenous Curatorial Collective, previously referred to as the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective. And uh, so no doubt this, in, this uh, organization is optimistic about the kind of changes you can bring with your position. I remember another organization prior to the ICC, uh, back in the 80s and 90s, in which, and it was around the time I was very much involved, not within it, but uh, in relation to it, but it was called SCANA, the Society of Canadian Artists of Native Ancestry. At the time, SCANA was very much interested in just getting recognition, getting the institutions, the art galleries to recognize, maybe even have artists exhibit in, in the institutions. But since then, a lot has changed since then. There's just tremendous uh, growth. And I'm just, uh, I'm hoping that uh, you might wanna talk about some of that growth, some of those ideas, some of the challenges that now confront the ICC, for example. And uh, certainly I, one of them that I see into the future, um, given your position now that, you know, we start developing, in addition to curators, we start developing perhaps new directors into the future. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so with uh, the Indigenous Curatorial Collective, uh, the, uh, I have great respect uh, uh, for Camille Escher and Camille Rivier, uh, the, uh, two of the uh, key staff members there, at least the ones that I work with the most. Uh, and uh, they've been doing, they're, they're my, uh, inspiration for the, the work that I do, like the community created through the Indigenous Curatorial Collective. That's uh, really where uh, I'm fed for the work that I need to do. Uh, and that the great work that they've been doing around champion, championing the spirit of care in their work as a core component of Indigenous curatorial plaque, uh, practice to balance that warriorship has been so necessary for kicking down doors and, and making change. Uh, but now uh, our kin are in institutions now, uh, but they're often alone. And uh, there's a push for these uh, uh, cluster hires like OCAD did um, and uh, other institutions uh, find that uh, network in solidarity. Uh, but uh, there's uh, when when indigenous folks were more thoroughly excluded, then we needed to create our own spaces and movements and create that uh, uh, that sense of community that comes with that. Uh, but uh, now uh, some of our most talented and creative uh, folks are being pulled into these non-indigenous institutions very early in their careers and need a strong sense of, uh, uh, need, need that help to create that community and belonging within the arts community as in addition to our own home communities. So that's one of the uh, struggles and issues that they've been doing. And uh, I guess we can move to the next slide. Uh, and so looking at, this is a recent event on kinship and solidarity across borders uh, for, uh, reaching out across to the United States as well into Mexico uh, to create that solidarity uh, with folks entering into institutions there. Uh, there's the Issues in Art Curation and Community Care series that was done recently that looked at perspectives around queer, two-spirit, gender minority, Northern, Francophone, and Black and Indigenous perspectives uh, to uh, just to have that that um, uh, I guess that collective um, that uh, we can work to, together with because of the uh, uh, you know there's there's the assimilationist legacy is uh, 
is still it's carrying on strong and there's a, there is a danger to an injury uh, in being brought into non-indigenous institutions that uh, uh, we have to safeguard against mm -hmm. there yeah i wish i had the icc when i was coming up <laughs> uh, but i had the artist with me right <laughs> yeah uh, scanner and uh so obviously now you see yourself opening doors uh maybe we can call it breaking through the buckskin ceiling right <laughs> so for the leaders of the future for indigenous uh curators so how do you see yourself opening up these doors with your new position? Yeah, so with this door being open for me, I think there's a, my responsibility is to open it even wider. The institutional change doesn't happen just by hold, then continuing to hold that open for people who are, who, uh, are like me, but, uh, but expanding that so that uh, we can help uh, expand our imagination of who's an acceptable leader for these types mm -hmm. of institutions and uh, remove some of the uh, homogeneity that's been there around uh, defining uh, Canada's cultural messaging. Yeah, I think that, you know, you hit on something about homogeneity, uh, but, you know, that landscape hopefully is changing. So I'm just wondering if you might have a, a bit of an influence on other museum directors to indigenize their institutions. In fact, maybe there are other directors who are who would, you know, probably be asking the same question in different ways. Yeah, when I was first when I first joined the Canadian Art Museum Directors Organization, CAMDO, in 2016, uh, then uh, I, I, I said I wouldn't sit on the indigenization committee, but I would meet with them and advise. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, uh, so we, the Indigenous Curatorial Collective started uh, some uh, relationships there. And uh, that's, that's had some really positive effects. And I've been seeing change at that organization in the leadership center since. Uh, also working with uh, BIPOC fellowship that's uh, we're, that's just getting off the ground at Lord Cultural Resources and with uh, Karen Carter's leadership is uh, helping uh, think through these strategies about how we can bring some of the uh, the work that's done through like the Canada Council's assistant to, assistance to Aboriginal curators for residencies program things like those initiatives but. Uh, thinking about how we can move that into a leadership role. So there's a lot of folks working on this that uh, I'm uh, uh, happy to be uh, collaborating with and supporting in whatever way I can. Let's go to the next slide. And I want you to talk about, this is a, a piece by Dwayne Linklater that was put up a few years ago. And uh, it's based on a line from the treaties and most treaties, I think will have this particular line in it. But you know what? Well, maybe not written, but spoken. Uh, spoken, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's something here interesting because in the last 10 years, we've been talking so much about the truth and reconciliation. And, uh, and of course the TRC commission wrote a major, major publication, which is used all across Canada and in, in virtually all institutions refer to it and respond to them. I wonder if Mackenzie uh, is also responding to it in, in different ways. And maybe you want to talk about that in relation to this work here. Yeah, so uh, Anthony Kendall uh, was the spearhead behind this new uh, public project initiative and did see it through that lens of uh, reconciliation. Uh, so uh, I don't end up using the term too much in relation to the work we do here, but about uh, looking at, uh, at embracing relationships and seeing how we can advance those. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, I was on the jury uh, for for this piece uh, before I worked at the McKenzie. 
Uh, and it's, I love hearing stories about how it's received uh, from uh, the, uh, after the uh, Colton Bushi verdict of uh, hearing from folks that driving and just feeling a sense of, uh, of comfort and solace from this piece uh, and of uh, the, uh, looking towards the future, it's called Kakeke forever, um, and really reminding us of the that this is uh, forever, and it's something it's a commitment to that relationship moving forward in a good way. And uh, so, this we held. We can move to uh, the next slide. Um, in thinking through those words and what it means to commission that, to bring it into our permanent collection and for the Mackenzie to be an owner of that type of work. Uh, is talking, uh, I worked with Janine Windoff, who was our curator of community engagement at the time. She's far to the left on this photo with uh, holding Anthony's hand. Uh, and we organized this event uh, for winter solstice. Uh, uh, that's Gary Bott uh, uh, drumming and uh, Elder Betty. Uh, they shared stories, and we thought we needed to hold a community event to uh, to pass the ownership of that work on to the community. That we're putting it on the building as reminders to the broader Regina community, but also to ourselves about our responsibilities. That we have that up there, and we need to be held accountable to it. Uh, and continuously, not through a single action, like commissioning that work, that's not doing the work, it's, uh, it's signaling the continuous work that needs to be done. Uh, so we held this event to uh, re request that the community accept this piece uh, and take uh, uh, ownership over it themselves. Yeah, you know when you when you ref, when we refer back to the the idea of cultural health, I think this this particular piece is really one of, uh, or at least Dwayne's piece is is um, one of empowerment. I think is you uh, to to say your word, um, to use your word, and because anybody who drives down the main drag of Regina, I think it's Broad Street. Is it or it's Albert, Albert Street? Albert Street, yeah. Driving down Albert Street by Mackenzie Gallery, you'll see this um, in the evening, you know, at dusk, dusk and dawn, and in the evening. And you see this very powerful piece. And I, I just, I think it speaks uh, volumes, you know, to that relationship in Regina that's so critical uh, to a community that has quite a large uh, urban indigenous population. And uh, just thinking about that, it reminds people of these kind of relationships that are that are not just now, but as you say, way into the future. You know, uh, until as long as the, the grass grows and the sun shines. So that's that's really really uh, important. Um, okay, so now we're in the gallery, and I want you to. We have a few minutes left. If you want to talk about. Uh, by way of your upcoming program, your exhibitions, what you're excited about. And we'll just run through the slides. You can talk to them in the last uh, few minutes that we have. So uh, just give us a sense of what you're planning. So I took this photo this morning. Uh, we're <laughs> installing this exhibition, Passive Cajun, uh, well, uh, the river that flows between the rocks, La Rivier qui passe entre le rocher. Uh, and this uh, it's a show I'm co-curating with Leolia Shragi on, uh, the, on languages in the shadow of colonialism. I'm very excited to open this piece, uh, uh, this, this whole exhibition. It's, we're closed. It's going to be, we have all new shows when we open up to the public. And, uh, uh, so working on that actively, I'll be back up there when we finish. Uh, this is, uh, we're hosting the Minecraft Artists in Residence program uh, in conjunction with Ender Gallery. Uh, so uh, the current exhibition on right now is uh, from Kat Haynes, uh, who did this, uh, created a gallery 
that is a Minecraft, uh, from a Minecraft replica of her surgically reconstructed pussy. Uh, and that's, uh, it really engages a lot of the tools of Minecraft. Uh, uh, and she has a, uh, we're hosting in conjunction with Pride coming up soon, uh, uh, pack the pussy uh, dance party that uh, people can <laughs> join from anywhere. Come in, uh, go into this uh, this into the uh, the uh, dance hall and uh, do have a little Minecraft party to celebrate this project. Uh, and this uh, the next three slides. These are works. Uh, this is Divya Mera it's, uh, from India to Canada. There's nothing that I can possess which you cannot take away. Uh, and this opened uh, in the fall and uh, and came down uh, in January. And um, if we go to the next slide, uh, it's a this piece. Uh, is called There's Nothing You Can Possess Which I Cannot Take Away, Not Vishnu, New Ways of Darsana. And you mentioned it was, the gallery used to be called the Norman Mackenzie Art Gallery. Uh, and this is uh, Divya's intervention into our collection that uh, while she was here researching for this work, she found records, read a story in Norman's own words uh, about him uh, uh, stealing a shrine, uh, uh, Annapurna uh, statue uh, that was at an active shrine and that people were worshiping at. And, uh, he hired somebody to have that work stolen. And so uh, she intervened in this and, and got us to start the process to, uh, to repatriate the piece. And we did uh, this fall. Uh, returned it to India uh, and she and we acquired this piece, uh, which is a bag of sand that's an equivalent weight to the sculpture that it's uh, taking the place of that she swapped and now sits in the same drawer where that piece used to be. Uh, and this is from that same show of uh, the, where that's the story typed out, dictated by Norman McKenzie. Of, uh, the, of him acquiring that original sculpture and in the, the book in which it's uh, held. Well, John, I really would like to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. I know how busy you must be uh, trying to run this institution. I'm sure your staff are at you every day, every hour. <laughs> you have you have collectors. You have um, who knows who you have breaking down your door to speak to you. So I really wanted to thank you, and uh, once again, congratulations on on your appointment. And I know you'll be there for a while. And and uh, we have we're expecting great things from you. So thank you once again. Yeah, good, good. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the audience for listening in today. Uh, I'd like to conclude uh, today by also thanking once again the President uh, Anna Serrano and the Canada Council for their generosity and continued support. I'd like to give a shout out for Saidi Akbari and Renzi Guaran of our OCAD University IT department for their oversight. I'd like you all to join us, not next week, but in two weeks time on June 3rd, when we'll be having a conversation with Rianne Chartrand from the McMaster University Art Museum. And then the following week after that, my final guest, a young curator by the name of Tara Hogue of the Reme Modern, which uh, and I hope you'll join us for that conversation on June 10th. So, uh, you know, it's all going south. I mean, it's all going west to Saskatchewan, I would say. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I'll be out there later this year. <laughs> so maybe I'll run into you, John. 
So check out again our full events page on listing on Eventbrite. And you can register on Eventbrite uh, or visit Onsite Gallery or even our Wapata website. So we look forward to seeing you here in two weeks time. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to everybody behind the scenes. Take care. Have a good day. Enjoy the summer. Spring, actually. Bye-bye.